Would you take your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 16, 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We'll look at verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. May the Lord bless the reading of his word here tonight. Again, going back to uh, verse 13, the question was asked at a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now let me tell you about Caesarea Philippi. It is located about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus' primary ministry took place. So way on up, about 25 miles. And then it was about five miles east of the Jordan River. And there was a, a, a great spring there that fed water into the Jordan River. And uh, Caesarea Philippi was named after Caesar, the emperor of Rome, by Philip, one of the uh, brothers uh, and sons of Herod the Great. Herod the Great, when he died, the kingdom was split into four parts, and they were called tetrarchs. And you had four uh, tetrarchs, three sons of Herod, and then Herod's sister. The, the three sons were Philip, Antipas, and Archelaus. And then, of course, Herod the great sister, uh, his uh, Salome, had the fourth tetrarch in the fourth part of the kingdom. Now, if you remember John the Baptist being beheaded, it was because Philip had a wife named Herodias, and Herod Antipas took her away from Philip, his brother. He took her to be his own wife. John the Baptist called him out on it and said, this is Rome. It is Rome. And John the Baptist just called him out on it and said so. And so they put him in prison and ultimately lost his head over it. You know the story. So that was uh, Philip's wife that was taken by Herod Antipas, his brother. I'm sure that those two didn't have much of a relationship going forward. Anyway, we see here that uh, Philip was, this was his territory. This was his tetrarch, and he named this area after the Caesar and put his own name in on it as well, calling it then Caesarea Philippi. That's how he got his name. Now, Jesus just so happens to go into that area. He goes to Caesarea Philippi, and while there, he asked his disciples a question, and this is considered to be the apex of Jesus' ministry on this earth. And what I mean by that, it was at this point that Jesus, all that he had done, that now he is looking his face toward the cross. He is determined at this point, at, 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 this, at this time in Caesarea Philippi, to focus now, zero in, on what he had come to do. Not that he hadn't, but he's really now focused on what's ahead. And Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, this particular story is written in all three of the synoptic gospels. You say, well, that's a big word, synoptic. What does it mean? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered to be the synoptic gospels and John is a gospel too, but it's written a little bit different than the other three. 
and therefore it's not classified among uh, as the same kind of writing style as the other three. And of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find that it's mentioned in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. So you don't have to turn there, just listen. Mark's version says, Mark 8, 27 through 30. Mark said, Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say one of the prophets. And he said unto them, Whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man. That's Mark's version. Now Luke. Luke said this in Luke 9, 18 through 21. And again, I'll read it to you. Came to pass as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom do men say that I am? They answering and said, John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others say that you're one of the prophets that is risen again. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them that they tell no man that thing. But now there's, that's Mark and Luke's version of what Matthew tells us here. But the thing is, they left out some very important stuff that Matthew does mention. And we're going to look at that here now. But he said, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? Now I want you to notice that son of man. Have you ever noticed Jesus always referred to himself as being the son of man? You know why? First of all, it is mentioned 82 times in the Gospels. 30 Two times it is mentioned in the book of Matthew alone. Jesus called himself the Son of Man for two reasons. One, because it represented his humanity. It means just like a human or a man. And so he called himself the Son of Man to show the people that he was preaching and teaching to that he identified with them. He came to be a man who would die on the cross. He's God in the flesh of a man. So he called himself the Son of Man. But also, it was a messianic title. Right, it is. For if you look in Daniel chapter 7, particularly verses 13 and 14, those verses, Daniel said that the Messiah, the Christ, would be called the Son of Man. So by Jesus referring to himself then as the Son of Man, not only is he identifying as a human, as a man, come to identify with us and be like us, but he is also identifying himself and recognizing, acknowledging that he is the Christ, the Messiah, as a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. So then he said, Whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But, but wait a minute now. Weren't those men at this time dead? Yes, they were. They knew John the Baptist had just died as he was brutally killed in an execution by beheading. They knew that. But they believed in the resurrection, and they believed that perhaps Jesus could have been John the Baptist come back to life, many in the crowd believe that, perhaps. And, uh, and, and then Elijah, many believed that he would come back to the earth. And, uh, and John the Baptist and Elijah were very similar in their, their styles and their appearance. And so many believed that perhaps Elijah had come back to a life. And some believed he could have been Jeremiah or another prophet. But Jesus looked at those men, those twelve, he said, but I, that's all right. He, he's saying, that's who they say I am. But he looks at them and he says, but who say ye that I am? Who do you say I am? And if you'll notice in Mark and Luke and now here in Matthew, Peter is the first one and only one to speak out. Why? 
Peter is some sort of kind of like a leader among the disciples. He was the outspoken one. Many would call him the big mouth. But Peter was the one who spoke out all the time. And uh, he was sort of, like I said, a leader among the twelve. And Peter, and Peter, and Jesus asked him the question to the twelve, to all of them, not specifically Peter only. He's asking it to the twelve, but Peter responds. So Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's two things he said here about Jesus. First, he said, You are the Christ. And by Peter saying that, they are recognizing that he is Israel's Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah that they were anticipating, that they were looking forward to coming. And so by Peter saying they are the Christ, he's understanding and acknowledging in his mind and in their mind as he represented the twelve that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. He then went on and he said, and you are the son of the living God. He said, I recognize, we recognize, not only are you Israel's Messiah, but what makes you uh, incredibly different than anyone else who's ever come and been a leader among the people of Israel is that he is God's very own son. And they're understanding that. He said, you are not only Israel's Messiah, but you are God's son, the son of God. So then Jesus answered and said unto him, it says, I know, he, he actually is answering unto them, but it says him, I guess just because Peter is the one who spoke. But he does address Peter here specifically. I, I don't know, maybe Jesus zeroed his eyes right in on Peter when Peter spoke on behalf of everyone. But Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon. He said, well, I thought his name was Peter. His name was Simon. Jesus gave him the name Peter, which we'll get to in a moment. But he said, Simon Barjona. You say, well, was that his last name? Barjona? I never heard such a name. Well, look, Bar, anytime you see B-A-R, Bar, in front of a name, it means son of. That's what it means in Scripture. So when it says Simon Barjona, it means Simon, son of Jonah. Jonah that was swallowed by the great big fish? No. That's a different one. Uh, you say, well, I thought that's, that's the only Jonah I know. Look, it's just a common name. Uh, just because the man who was swallowed by the fish, his name was Jonah, does not mean that Peter's father was the one who was swallowed by the fish. It's just another man named Jonah. That's Peter's father. And so Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon, bar Jonah, that is, Simon, son of Jonah, blessed are you. And then he said to him, this is when Jesus gives him a name. He said, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. He's saying, Peter, the only way you can discern that I am Israel's Messiah and the Son of God, the only way you can discern and understand that is by God speaking to your heart and letting you know this. God has revealed this to you. No other man, God did. It's a God thing. So Jesus said, I say unto thee then, verse 18, your name from here on shall be called Peter. He said, thou art Peter. Now what does that mean and what is it, what's the significance about that? Well, let me tell you that Peter comes from a Greek word called Petros, which means a stone. Actually, like a little rock that would fit in your hand. That's what Peter meant. He said, thou art Peter, Petros, a little stone, and upon this rock, and the Greek word for rock here is Petra, which means a large stone, like a big boulder, huge stone, one that you cannot hold in your hand, one that is large on the ground, and would take several men, perhaps, to push it and move it, if even possible. So, thou art Peter, a little stone, and upon this massive rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, where are we going with this? Just hang with me, look. He said, I'll build my church, 
Now, some have thought that Peter and the Roman Catholic religion, I don't call them a denomination because they're not uh, Protestant like we are, and I don't mean to pick on Roman Catholics, but I'll just tell it like it is. They believe that Peter was the first pope and that all other popes came in succession after Peter. Let me tell you something. At the, at the beginning of the church, James was the pastor of the church, not Peter. Peter was not a pope. The Bible doesn't say anything like that. So we cannot say at all that the church was founded upon Peter. It was not founded upon Peter. It was not founded upon Petros, the little stone. It was founded upon Petra, the huge boulder, the large rock. And what is that? We'll get to it. Just listen. He said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I have always preached and have always believed, as do many, that the word rock here represents the confession or the acknowledgement that Peter made when he said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. It is upon that confession that, that Romans 10, 9 says, that if thou wilt confess with thy heart that he is our Savior, we shall be saved. So it is upon that confession, that acknowledgement, is a huge, massive rock and that's what Jesus has built his church upon. But it also, the word rock, meaning that it's massive, represents Jesus. For I think it's in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Could be wrong, but I think that's it. says that Jesus was the rock in the wilderness that gave water to the Israelites when they were thirsty. And so Jesus is the rock. That being said, we could say either one of those works here and that the church was built upon the rock confession made by Peter that we all make or have made that Jesus is the Savior. It's the acknowledgement, the confession that we make that he is the Savior and it is also built upon Jesus himself. For in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And then I want to tell you something, too. That Jesus, when he first called Peter to be a disciple, Andrew found Jesus before Peter did. Andrew was the brother of Jesus. And Andrew found the Lord as his uh, leader to follow, and he says to Peter, Come and meet this man named Jesus and introduces him. And this is from John's gospel, not one of the synoptic gospels, but from John. And John said this, listen to it. John said, we, uh, Peter said, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, that is brought Peter or Simon, brought Simon. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon, son of Jonah, and thou shalt be called Cephas. Cephas, right, which is by interpretation a stone, a small stone, a Petros. Why Cephas? Because the written language in the New Testament time was Greek, but the spoken language was Aramaic. And Cephas is Aramaic, whereas Peter was Greek. They both mean the same thing. So when Jesus first initially called Peter to be his disciple, or one of the twelve, he already had a plan. He already knew Peter was going to be this rock. A rock-solid leader Peter would become was kind of wishy-washy and, and unstable until, he, uh, until after Christ had resurrected and he met him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And, and uh, Peter got straightened out, and then Peter preached that sermon on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people got saved. There again, why some people think that Peter is the first pope. No, he was not. He was a leader in the church. The church was not built on Peter. It was not built on the apostles. It was built on not a man. I just read the verse, 1 Corinthians 3.11. 
No other foundation but the foundation of Jesus Christ himself. That's what the church is built on, the acknowledgement that he's Savior and on him as the Savior. That's what the church was built on. So he said, Thou art Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word hell that we use in English is actually comes from a, a Hebrew word Sheol and a Greek word Hades, which means the abode of the dead. It's the grave. It's death. It means death. And so death cannot conquer the church. We all die. We will die unless the rapture precedes it. But if we know Christ is our Savior, then death will not defeat us. We have victory over death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Because we have salvation in Christ Jesus. Amen. And death cannot conquer, and nor can anything conquer. And even if you want to call it hell, here is the literal place of, of the demons and and the lost to go and, and, and burn there forever. If you want to uh, use that and say that, well, I'd just say that the fires of hell and the powers of hell can't do anything to stop the church. The fires of hell have come to this world and through persecution for generation upon generation have done everything they possibly could to stop the movement of, of God's church and to no avail. They can't do it. So then, look, verse 19, Peter, uh, Jesus said to Peter, I give you the keys. Good, Peter's got him a keys to a new, brand new spanking automobile, right? No, they didn't have cars back then. You can't use a key on a camel or a donkey. So what's Peter going to drive? Nothing. Did they lock their doors of their houses? I really doubt it because it wasn't like it is now where we have to lock things to be secure and safe. So what are these keys for? And what are keys used for? Keys are used to enter. They're used to open the door, to enter in. And so he gives Peter the keys. And there again, this is why some people think, well, Peter is this great man. And, you know, you hear all these jokes about going to heaven and there's St. Peter there at the pearly gates waiting. You hear, how many jokes have we heard like that? I've heard my share. I mean, goodness gracious. Look, I'm not going, when I go to heaven, I'm not going to look for St. Peter. I'm looking for Jesus. Amen. I'd like to look him up and talk to him later on, but I, initially I'm going to see Jesus and all my loved ones. That's what's most important to me. So all these jokes that people tell about Peter's at the pearly gates is because Jesus gave him the keys. They say Jesus, uh, Peter has the keys to the door of heaven, and Peter can determine who goes to heaven and who, no, Peter does not have a say-so in this. It's Jesus only who has the say-so and who goes in and who goes out. So what did it mean by give him giving Peter keys? It's symbolic talk of he gave him the gospel. The keys are the gospel. The way to heaven is through God's word. God's word shows us how to go to heaven and be with the Lord. And by giving Peter as a leader of the, the disciples and a leader of the church, they have the gospel that they give to all the people to show them the way unto heaven. And so he gave Peter these keys, or this gospel, this word. And by the way, let me tell you something. The word church was a word that the people of Israel did not know in those days, because it was not, the church was non-existent in the Old Testament. The church did not begin until after Jesus resurrected from the dead. And then at Pentecost, the church was born when people were getting saved. And, and, and the church will exist, will exist on this earth until the rapture happens. Amen. Then the church will be raptured out to be with God in heaven. So, anyway, he gave him the keys and, uh, in, to heaven. And he said, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And there again, people use this to say that he gave the apostles some disciplinary power and authority as authoritative people. Thus, there again, I hate to go back to it, but the, the popes and the authority that they have of discipline and, 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 and so forth, that's, this could be no, nothing can be further than, from the truth than that. that. You know, it, that's not what Jesus was saying here. 
what he was saying, and I'll try to be as basic about this and as simple about this as I possibly can, and that is that whoever will reject the gospel that is preached to them, then they are bound from going to heaven. And, they, and this happens because they made the decision themselves. And then whoever will receive Christ is loosed from this binding and, uh, and allowed to go to heaven. It's as simple as that. I mean, I don't know how to make it more simple. And, uh, and so there's nothing that Peter can do to discipline someone and withhold something from someone or to reward someone that comes from the Lord. And uh, Peter is just presented the gospel and saying, uh, being told by Jesus to take this and show people the way into heaven. And then... By the way, the door into heaven is Jesus himself. As he said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And again, why? So many times we see that Jesus would do a miracle or something like this and tell people, don't go around telling everybody. The reason for this was, remember, the Roman Empire was in control. You see, I thought Herod was. Philip and Anthipas and Archelaus and then, of course, Aunt Salome. No, yeah, they had their tetrarchs, but they were just more like puppet dynasties. The real power and control came from the Romans. They just allowed these the Israelites to have their kings. And um, so the Romans were in control, and they did not want any kind of a movement, a religious movement like this. And Jesus knew that he was not the kind of Messiah or the Christ that the people of Israel were anticipating or looking for. They were looking for a Davidic-type Messiah who would lead them in a revolt or rebellion against the Romans. That wasn't Jesus. As the real Messiah, he was come to love people and to save the lost. That was his intention. That was his purpose. And he knew he was not the kind of Messiah, the kind of Christ that they were looking for. And so he knew that if, he, if the word got out that he was the Messiah, then all the Jewish people would be getting excited and they'd start telling everybody and everybody would be trying to crown him as king. And then the Romans would see all of this going on and they would have stopped it prematurely before Jesus would go to the cross and die for our sins. So it was not time. That's the simple reason why Jesus said, don't tell anyone yet. Hold on to it. Within time, it would be known throughout the world. So we see here in this passage that Jesus, I I guess in some sort of way, this is the beginning of the church. Although it really wasn't the church until after he died on the cross and resurrected. And then the church was, some people say it was born on the day of Pentecost. Whenever you want to say it was born or had begun, I would say this is kind of, as I said, the apex of his ministry. And it was the point, the pinnacle, where he's now beginning to face toward the cross and his mission and fulfilling it of being our Savior. Thank you for listening. Let us pray.